Hunt the Parenting is a series which intentionally leaves a great number of questions and mysteries in its wake. Being based on World of Darkness, a property known for having like eight and a half different secret societies, HDP takes advantage by not only leaving questions as to what exactly is going on or who is responsible for it, but also what specifically is the cause of it. The mystery of who uh, retired Fatigue from the Mortal Coil isn't just the question of who did it and why, but of what did it. The question of the 99p store and the blue man isn't just a question of what is going on, but what supernatural phenomenon is doing it. The question of horse isn't just what his ramblings mean, but also what godforsaken nightmare they are. It establishes dozens of questions with hints that could take you in any direction to keep you guessing. And of course, none of that takes away from the fact that the questions of who did it and why are still present. It's a perfect storm for theory crafting, and I am not a theory channel. Might be a bit of a weird way to open up a video like this, but this isn't a normal video for me, and nor is how I'm going to handle this one. When I make videos, I tend to adhere to a few criteria. I try to use language in a certain way as to only refer to what we do know, I try not to date my videos, and I avoid putting out blatantly wrong information like the plague. It's a point of personal pride, and having information on my channel that is either wrong or unrepresentative of me is something that causes me great personal pain. So theory content is not exactly the kind of thing that I would normally do. However, with the release of Chapter 4, my thoughts on the Who Done It and a number of other theories, and at the request of a great number of people, I've decided that, alright, I will make a video going over the various theories of Hunter the Parenting. But this will be a different kind of video. Namely, I fully intend to delist this video the moment it becomes outdated and put it into a public playlist so it's still available but not on the main channel page. So there are three options if you're viewing this. Option 1 is that you're seeing it while it's public. Option 2 is that you're seeing it while it's unlisted and came to either mock me for being wrong or praise me for my psychic slash reality warping abilities. And option 3 is that you're watching a public video but it's a reaction channel that's reacting to it. Hi Aria, how you doing buddy? 99p? Oh, pounds. So, I'm not going to go over every single theory in the series, just the ones I find particularly interesting or have something to say on. Some of them I will provide my own theories on, and others I'll recount and then give my opinion on the theory itself. Ever since I got into HDP, I've done an ungodly amount of research into the various game settings and rules of this universe, so I'd like to think that I have some interesting perspectives to add. And finally, this won't be edited to the same extent as the D or Kevin videos were. This is more of a stream of conscience type video, so I'll be more prone to tangents and the likes. The only other thing left to note outside of that is, if you notice my voice being a little bit strange throughout this, you will have to forgive me. I have had two wisdom teeth removed yesterday from the time of recording this. I am in pain. Never let it be said that I'm not dedicated. Okay, let's not waste any time. The best way to start this off is to just jump straight into it with some of the more minor theories. So this is a small personal one to start with that I've barely seen anyone mention, so this should be a fun start. And it should also reveal what I mean when I say that we'll talk about theories. Some of them will be big ones like the whodunit of chapter 4, which we'll be getting to later but some of them will just be small, fun ones like this. Speaking of which, disciplines are vampiric powers to make it incredibly simple. Invisibility, heightened senses, that sort of thing. These all fall under the definition of disciplines. Different vampire clans have access to different disciplines while being unable to access others. One of the disciplines of the clan Dromir is Auspex. This is a discipline which, at the higher levels, allows the user to send telepathic messages into the minds of their targets. So here's my theory. Kevin has this discipline. What is my evidence for this? Well, in the Blender Crusade, D keeps hearing Kevin yelling at him in his head, while this initially is just Kevin recounting arguments he made in the short, where he and D argue over the merits of purchasing a Blender for 99p. It eventually goes off and Kevin starts rambling and saying a bunch of stuff that he did not stay in the short. And D also keeps referring back to how he can almost hear Kevin speaking to him, or how he's going to spite Kevin referring to his voice as real or imagined, which is... A very specific thing to comment on more than once. I don't know, I just find this notion funny. The notion of Kevin sitting in a basement using his supernatural abilities to argue with D while he's at a 99p store about 20 miles away. It's just funny, so I thought I'd mention it. So, there have been theories about Kitten since day one. His outfit, though a reference to his appearance in If the Emperor Had a Texas Speech Device, where his entire body was always covered by his armor, this also seems to have been the subject of some theories of what exactly he's hiding underneath it all. 
In chapter 3, when Kitten is stuck in a hole by Piotr, he does this cat-like pose. <laughs> And in the audio log, something is wrong with horse, he also tells a story of how he first encountered a vampire and ended up in a fist fight with it. Vampires are notoriously far stronger than humans, so the fact that Kitten survived at all is a miracle. Moreover, he managed to kill the vampire by kicking it out a window and then onto a spiked railing below. To actually kick someone out a window requires a lot of force. I think that this theory may also be tongue-in-cheek backed up by door mistaking Kitten as a member of the British military and then requesting a CQC close quarters combat encounter. That, 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 that feels like foreshadowing to me. <laughs> anyway, these factors combined have led people to speculate that Kitten is some sort of werebeast. I think this theory makes sense, but well, I'm of two minds about it. On the one hand, this could be an interesting way to diversify the main family, but also I feel like it could take away from the these are regular humans fighting against the supernatural tides of the world thing, which I really like. I, I like stories of underdog, regular everyday people forced to combat the overwhelming powers that be. Th that could be more down to personal preference, but that's what it is. But considering there are games like Mage and Werewolf in World of Darkness, which can have regular people finding out that they're not so regular... I, I think it'd come down to how well it's executed, to be honest. So we'd have to see, though if there is one thing I trust Ogre Papanong to do well, it's executing their writing twists well. They are bloody masters at it. It's something to think about at least. Assuming the kitten is a werebeast of some kind, then if they wanted to keep up the cat motif, then it's likely he's a bastard of some kind. A were-feline. As for which kind, there's a couple of options I could see. A Simba might make sense since they're lions and the lion is the national animal of England. He could also be a Cilician, as they're one of the only rare feline breeds native to Europe that I can find. But they're also rare and tied to the Fae, and you know, burn the Fae. If they wanted to make him very cat-like, he could be a Babasti, but that that's all up in the air. Another option is that he's a kinfolk. Basically, one of his relatives somewhere down the line was a werebeast. Basically, he has werebeast blood in him, but isn't a shapeshifter himself. I like this better than him being a werebeast himself, but only slightly. But those are my thoughts on Kitten's werebeast theory, at least. Now, let's move on to... Alright, now we're getting into some of the more interesting ones. In the audio log, Marcus goes clubbing with his weirdo friends. He gets into a fight with Brock Blacklaw. Brock has tormented Marcus for years. After tricking Brock into embarrassing himself, Marcus challenges Brock to a drinking game in which his drinks aren't alcoholic, but Brock's are. When Marcus reveals this, Brock snaps out of his drunken stupor and they get into a fight. During the fight, Marcus grabs a family heirloom stool of some kind, and Brock attempts to negotiate an exchange for it and Grimmel, who he has grabbed hold of. During this, Marcus agrees and says, I swear though, if you try anything, the sickness of dogs long past will haunt you. So after the exchange, Brock goes back on his word and keeps threatening Marcus and his friends, and that's when the shenanigans begin. Brock pulls out a switchblade, it falls apart. He pulls out another, it detonates in his hand. He pulls out a bigger knife and a cop shows up. And then it's revealed that a lot of the drinks that he had just had were part of a recall, namely, they had been infected with salmonella. Marcus's friend Elise seems to contemplate this for a moment, but then rejects the thought out of hand. But it's pretty clear something has just happened here. Like, there isn't really any getting around that fact. The question is precisely what has happened. Marcus doesn't seem aware himself of what exactly just happened either. When questioned by this by his friend Harry, and how he set it all up, he flatly denies having done so. And it's unlikely he's lying about that either, because if he was lying and just trying to hide what he had done, then one has to wonder why he didn't use whatever the hell this was against Piotr in the third chapter. Seems weird to use it against Brock, but not against the vampire trying to slaughter his entire family. So, whatever has happened here, he isn't explicitly aware of it. And there are a couple of options that I can think of. The first one is the obvious one, and that's that Marcus is a mage, but isn't necessarily aware of it. What this appears to be is a curse known as the Path of Fortune. According to the White Wolf Wiki, this is the art of applying hexes and curses on a person. For the curse to work, the user must harness their hatred and spite against the target, preferably with some parts of them at hand. These curses activate themselves when coincidence would allow them to. They can also incur blessings, which... Yeah, no, that, that, that's pretty much exactly what happened. Like, that, that's word for word. That's pretty undebatable in my mind. 
The main issue is that, according to Mage the Ascension, a mage can't learn the paths because they aren't true magic. This is going to get confusing, so stick with me on this. To sum it up as briefly and broadly to the point that ward scholars are going to be hunting me down in the streets and saying that everything I've said is wrong, there's a lot of magic, but there are two main ones. True magic and sorcery. Basically, humanity can be split in two when it comes to magic. The awakened, which are mages, and the sleepers, which is everyone else. Magic itself can also be split in two, which, for the sake of simplicity, is true magic, which mages use, and not true magic, which is basically everything else. So, sleepers cannot use magic, but they can use sorcery, because sorcery is kind of like a math test. If you do everything right, there is a correct answer. So, if sleepers follow specific instructions exactly, they can perform sorcery. Sorcery is different from true magic in that it's not nearly as powerful, but it also doesn't incur paradox. Paradox being something that happens when a mage uses magic too obviously. Basically, magic is powered by belief, so the beliefs of sleepers also impacts how magic is seen in the world of darkness. Mage wants to fly, the rest of the world doesn't think that they can, and so paradox slaps them across the face and calls the reality cops. I cannot go one topic in World of Dark without going on like six different tangents. Anyway, the reason that I mention all of this is to basically say that if you're a mage and you want to avoid paradox, you have to do so in a way that sleepers will accept. They won't accept you turning into a dragon, but they will accept you firing a gun, the bullet bouncing off the walls like 16 times and then hitting the target. That is technically possible and thus is called coincidental magic, whereas turning into a dragon would be vulgar magic. So that's a lot of info which all comes to this point. If Marcus is a mage, but isn't aware of it, then he is demonstrating some magnificent control over his abilities that he doesn't even seem to know he has. Magic isn't like turf shit that I mean Harry Potter. It's not like you can just say abracadabra and then wave a wand and the thing happens. There are mages that work like that, but they do so seemingly for the show of it and because Paradox has worked differently in centuries past and we're already so deep into things that Marcus would have no way of knowing about any of this. I'm not saying it's impossible for him to be a mage, that is a perfectly rational conclusion to come to given the evidence. The term reality does come up a few times and magic in this universe is basically reality warping. And this team doesn't use words carelessly. And it could be that I'm looking way too far into this, but I'm not sure if this is what demonstrates Marcus being a mage. I'm suggesting that there may be another explanation, one which I find incredibly funny, absurd beyond belief, stupid enough that it is exactly the kind of thing that this team of writers would do, and also would prove me correct in my belief that we shouldn't treat these characters as straight up proxies from TTS placed into World of Darkness, because if I am right, that is proof Ogre Poppin are using that knowledge of how people view this series to fuck with us. So, if we reinvestigate the scene here, a certain object is called it to attention a lot, and multiple times it's even pointed out how incredibly unusual it is to even have it. It's the Black Law family heirloom, the folding chair. Stick with me for a moment on this, alright? When Brock gets drunk and then basically powers through it, he's in physical contact with the folding chair. When Marcus makes his curse thread against Brock, he's also got hold of the folding chair. Both of these are made incredibly clear each time, and the effects of both are quite clearly in line with the Path of Fortune I mentioned earlier. So, in Mage, an item infused with magic is called a talisman. Sleepers can use these. My personal theory is that this stupid folding chair is actually a talisman. That may also explain why Brock is so concerned about it being broken. Assuming he knows about magic, then he would understand the implications of what would happen. Assuming he doesn't, then his father certainly would. And Brock's anxiety of it being broken would likely come from countless reminders from his father to not break or even touch the thing. I feel like Brock's reaction to the stool could be indicative of something. I wonder if you can tell that I've lost my mind slightly by researching World of Darkness and analysing this team's tendencies when writing. I feel like a goddamn conspiracy theorist trying to convince you all I'm not completely insane. This is all real, I promise. Actually, speaking of things that break my mind... Okay, so this is going to be a long section. In the audio log, Something is Wrong with Horse, we learn that the family does indeed have a horse, which D treats as though it's one of his sons. If it is one of his sons, I... I, I, am, I am not prepared for the implications of such a thing. Anyway, Boy is left low with Horse, at which point the damned thing starts talking. Gaze into my crimson miasma. I'm good, thanks. So, what is this horse? Frankly, I try to think about this thing as little as possible, but if I had to guess, a demon. 
Demons in World of Darkness are capable of something called a possession, where they basically cut the soul out of a living creature, usually one with a very weak will, and then they place themselves in the body in place of the soul. This grants them the ability to separate from the abyss, which is hell in the religious sense of the word, and interact with the mortal realm. Also talks about the Elohim, which is usually a reference to angels. Demons are fallen angels, so in religious scripture, Elohim can refer to both demons and angels. However, in the world of darkness, demons are referred to as the fallen, which could be indicative of something. He doesn't mention the fallen, but he does mention the Elohim. In fact, interestingly, the only two main groups he doesn't mention in some form or another are the fallen, explicitly, and the wraiths. And there is also the fact that very few people are even supposed to know about the Elohim, so my guess is a demonic possession. But not mentioning wraiths is interesting to note, at least. There'll be more about wraiths later, so we'll get into that. So that's that part, but what exactly is Horse saying? Now, that is subject to a lot of debate, but it seems to be a prophecy of some description. As always, it ultimately comes down to the execution, but I don't particularly care much for prophecies as a concept when it comes to storytelling. Actually, let me go on a related tangent here for a moment. I dislike prophecies and fate as a concept in the same way I dislike, say, future sight in some series because they basically remove any defying the odds elements from the narrative. Like there's a prophecy and, and then you watch the journey and the narrative is constantly going, will our heroes succeed? Yes, they will. It's been preordained. You established that from the beginning. Why are you pretending that this is even a question? This day, my favorite example of future sight and the likes comes from a series called Tokyo ESP, where one of the characters has future sight, but it's incredibly limited to just a few seconds, and he isn't seeing the future so much as he's seeing like thousands of possible futures all at the same time, and then taking the actions required to arrive at the outcome that he wants. But this does mean that if he's in, say, a fight with someone and they're better trained, better skilled, and more knowledgeable than him, it is possible that there is no outcome in which he can win. Basically, I like prophecies and fate in only two scenarios. It's less about preordained outcomes and creating your own, or just utterly obliterating them outright. J just making sure that we all understand I'm analysing this under duress. Now, there are a number of theories online, and I'll be using some of them as a launching off point. I'll put links to them in the description. Also, Horse talks a lot of ye old English, so the way to translate this is to look at the words and see if we can form something coherent by looking at their translations from ye old English and also finding World of Darkness terminology. I also feel the need to point out we don't have a lot of reason to suspect that this prophecy isn't dependent on information that will come out in episodes to come. We just started Arc 2, it could be within Arc 2 or Arc 3 or whoever knows how much further down the line, that we'll learn new information that will make this prophecy seem, well, less apocalyptic. We're pretty much trying to decode it based on Arc 1 and assuming that we have everything we need. It's, it's just worth considering that we may not have all the information needed to properly decode it, but we only have the information we have right now, so let's go over what it could mean based on what we do know. It is it ghost both thine eyes see it. Oracle. Now, an oracle in World of Darkness tends to refer to a specific type of mage which has achieved ascension. Basically, mage godhood, for lack of a better term. It's the highest stage a mage is capable of achieving, and they basically leave their mortal body behind. Some oracles can refuse to ascend though and stick around on Earth to help or hinder other mages on their paths to ascension. Also, calling Boy an oracle could imply that Boy is a mage, or the reincarnated soul of a mage who achieved ascension. There have been angels and therefore fallen who can see into the future, so this could be that. Perhaps this explains these attitudes towards Boy. In the very first episode, he keeps mentioning that Boy can master reality. Magic in World of Darkness is just warping reality. So maybe D is aware of what Boy is. In Old English, Faust is a contraction for thou hast, meaning you have. So the first line means what is it you see or what is it you have seen, which may help to imply this further. I'm Vader, laid bare. Desiccated on the rocks, by thy hand, the abbot will know. Thine means yours and Fader means father, so this is referring to a parental figure, most likely Dor. Apparently there are some people who think the boy is adopted, but according to a post I found in which a writer was asked, No! This is what happens when you keep transpositioning TTS onto HTP. Stop it. So we can operate on the assumption that this is referring to Dor. Desiccated on the rocks by thy hand, the literal translation of something 
being desiccated is that it is being completely dried up. This line seems to be referring to the idea that something will happen wherein Boy does something to Dor. Potentially killing him? It's hard to say, but Boy and Dor's opinions on vampirism seem to differ quite dramatically. Dor has shown himself to be completely unempathetic to vampires and believes they are all 100% destined to become monsters. The existence of characters like Kevin prove him more or less objectively incorrect in this regard. So maybe Kevin still being around may have something to do with it? Remember, none of the family even know that Kevin hasn't been subjected to final death yet. Dee doesn't seem to have told them. Perhaps Dor simply can't get past this and refuses to see Kevin as a person and then stuff happens? An abbot is a term used in the Sabbat lexicon. Their job is basically to maintain the territory of a pack or group of vampires. Perhaps in this instance it refers to the regent or the prince or a member of the Sabbat we aren't yet aware of. Whoever it is, it's referring to someone of major influence within vampiric society. Now, this is an interesting line, mostly because it is so open to interpretation and fully depends on what the two part of this means. Of two could mean a lot of things. Assuming Boy and Marcus are both majors, it could refer to them. But to me personally, when I think of the term of two, I think of couple, as in a romantic couple. Kitten and Marcus, or potentially Kitten and Grimmel. Damnation could refer to one of them being embraced. Souls are a thing in World of Darkness, and when someone becomes a vampire, their souls are considered condemned by God. So in World of Darkness, God foresaw the fall of demons, the fall of mankind, allowed it to happen anyway, cursed Cain, didn't stop Cain when he started making vampires and condemned the souls of a bunch of people, Cain and his friends randomly decided to ruin the days of even when they didn't deserve it, and then when the world got bad, he basically just left. Is it just me or in World of Darkness is God kind of a gaslighting, abusive, spiteful asshole? Anyway, the point being that Damnation may refer to one of the two, whomever they are, being embraced or maybe ghouled, who knows. Maybe that'll have some bearing on another theory down the line. The third eye opens is an interesting one. If you recall from the probing of Kevin, Dee mentioned that he knew about the Diablerie of Saulot. This was basically an event in which the House of Trimia's founder, a bloke called Trimia just to make this perfectly confusing, basically turned himself into a vampire and diablerized an antediluvian called Saulot. Saulot had a third eye in the literal sense, right in his forehead. He also claimed to have found a new path to enlightenment called Golconda, which is basically a state in which a vampire is no longer at war with the beast in themselves, but simply they are able to return to humanity or as close to it as they're going to get. The third eye opening could refer to such an event, Possibly for Kevin or another member of the family who falls and is embraced. His sweat will feed and warm her gullet. The damage will know. Okay, so sweat is like the fat and round the loins and kidneys in sheep and cows, which suggests to me that someone is getting eaten. This might be in line with someone being embraced. It's interesting to note that Dor did get bitten during the first episode, and this could be a reference to that too. Foreshadowing, perhaps? A patriarch in mastering Luna ends hamstrung. He will wish death upon his flesh, but no mercy shall be given, for none he hath gave. Okay, this could have a lot of meanings, and it all really depends on who the patriarch is. D fits the definition of a patriarch. A patriarch is basically just the male head of a group, usually a family or a tribe. D is the leader of his family, so this definition fits. However, it doesn't fit with the no mercy shall be given for none he have gave. Nearly everything we've seen with D has been him showing mercy wherever he's capable of doing so. He's shown mercy to Kevin and he comforted the old woman as she awaited the son. It is of course possible that this referred to his past, we will get to that shortly. But non is a very strong word here. We know that D has shown mercy. It could fit Dor. Dor isn't a patriarch, at least not in the strictest definition of the word. You could say he's boy's patriarch since he's his father, which does suggest that Dor may have or had a partner, which if he was the head of such a unit could define him as a patriarch. We also know that he was in the military and part of the EOD. 
Depending on his rank, it could refer to that too. Perhaps he was the head of a squad. One might argue that this fits Dor better since Dor's merciless attitude towards vampires is well documented and displayed, which could hit more at the idea of Dor getting iced. Frankly, I don't know if we have enough information to make any conclusive statements on this part. We know Dor doesn't care for vampires, we don't know if this attitude extends to towards, say, werewolves or changelings, for example. It could be that this is a vampire specific thing, and we can speculate, but at the moment, we don't know anything about Dee's past. At this point in time, this could be referring to Occam for all we bloody know. I simply don't think we have enough information at the moment to make any strong statements on this part of the prophecy. Mastering Luna is interesting though. Luna is a celestial spirit that is of significance to werewolves. In Mastering Luna could refer to the idea of someone mastering being a werewolf or perhaps taming one. Being hamstrung means being crippled. So we have a male character, a patriarch of some sort, ending up mastering a werewolf in some way, only to be crippled. Or it could mean they were trying to fight a werewolf. Do whatever you want with that information because frankly I don't know what to make of it. I can tell that someone has spent a lot of time working on horses ramblings here because this is the most infuriatingly vaguely worded prophecy I can imagine. There's like seven different meanings for every single bloody line it could take and it's driving me up the wall. Arise in pain, shall signal war's end. War and triumph, the abbot will know from them. Bloodshed! Armageddon for all! So according to another analysis by Secrets from Beyond 7-9, this could refer to the three aspects of the Triad in Werewolf the Apocalypse, the Wield, the Weaver and the Worm. Basically three forms of nature incarnate. I'm vastly oversimplifying there, but just, just bear with me, please. Lever Software seems to think that it's referring to mages in some way, perhaps the Ascension War, which is the conflict between mages over the nature of reality itself. I also read somewhere that it could refer to Gehenna, as the Antediluvians all rise from their slumber, the Antediluvians being the third generation of vampires. Maybe it's all free, who knows anymore, I'm going insane researching this bit and time has lost all meaning. Thank you D, I couldn't agree more! Time, kindred, Garu. In the light, they all will. Good god, maybe it is referring to all of them coming to light at once. Though interrupted, this could refer to a breakdown of the masquerade or of the supernatural broadly. Or maybe it's the path of redemption. Lever Software suggests as much. Who knows? None of us. That's who. Again, I don't think we have enough information to make sense of the prophecy yet. We're looking at an incomplete picture right now. Hell, we aren't even sure how literal the bits we do know are. They could be far more abstract than we're giving them credit. Mastering Luna could mean beating the supernatural creatures that prowl at night for all we know. Mastering Luna, mastering the night, because the moon is only out at night. There's just too much information that we don't know about this whole thing yet. It's certainly a source of interesting speculation, no doubt about that. And like I said, someone on the Ogre Papanong team is giggling to themselves knowing that they have done a good job at making the most infuriatingly impossible to deconstruct prophecy known to man. Kudos whoever you are, you prick. <laughs> There's also the possibility that I do feel the need to mention, and that's that this isn't the prophecy and this isn't a demon, but a fae that's just fucking with boy. I don't give this one too much credit because like, a fae shouldn't know about the Elohim. It also uses the term milklings, which is a slur for changelings who are fake, kind of. It's complicated, but I thought I'd mention it. Alright, I mentioned wraiths earlier. That would be a perfect lead into the next theory that surrounds them, but to do that properly, we need to talk about another theory. Namely, about Dee's age. Oh, good. So this one will be a little different in that I'm not going to present my own theories, and I'm mostly just going to give my thoughts on other people's theories. There is a large chunk of the HTP fandom that believes, to the point it's unofficially considered explicit canon, that D is far older than he seems to be. Now, there's a fair bit of evidence to suggest such a thing, the fact that he looks younger than Dor, and Dor looks like he could be in his 50s. During the probing of Kevin, D says that he has been fighting the supernatural since the 90s, Kevin accused it of being the 1890s, and D doesn't argue that fact at all. He will often refer to units of weight in terms of minas, which are a unit of measurement invented in Babylonia during the Mesopotamian era, and has been used throughout the region. There are some that say him mentioning the game of Ur is proof of this, which 
Okay, permit me to go on an anthropological rant for a moment here. Assuming the was from Mesopotamia and knew what the game of Ur was, he would not call it the game of Ur. You want to know how I know that? Because the ancient Mesopotamians didn't call it the game of Ur. The game boards were found by a British archaeologist in the 1920s during excavations at the Royal Cemetery at Ur in Iraq. It's named after an archaeological site. We have no idea what they called the game. It would be like if someone in the year 3000 found a Monopoly board in Ukraine, Kiev and called it the game of Kiev. No, this cannot be used as proving the D is ancient. Then again, assuming the D is this old, knowing the writer's D probably never bothered to learn the actual name of the game and just decided to call it the game of Ur after seeing it in Ur. Or perhaps I'm overthinking this entire situation and Dean knows that calling the game of Ur something other than the game of Ur would lead to questions that he can't answer so he just doesn't. Analyzing theories like this does weird stuff to my brain, <laughs> I've learned. Sorry about that. I like anthropology and I feel like I'm losing my mind the more of this that I do. Anyway, yes, there are a fair few hints that D is a lot older than he appears to be, and from that a number of theories have spiralled out around who he is, up to and including that he is either Abel, the brother Cain supposedly killed that led to him being cursed by God, which led to the rise of vampires, or Seth, the third child of Adam and Eve. Let's cover the Adam and Eve child thing first. I hate this idea. Look, this is more of what I mentioned when I talked about Kitten. To me, this takes away from the original pitch of the series, that the family were just a bunch of roughly regular humans fighting the world of the supernatural. To be fair, I wouldn't mind a story about the family of supernaturals fighting the darker aspects of that world, but that wasn't the pitch I was sold on. As for Dee being the child of Adam and Eve, you know how I mentioned back that what I found most appealing about World of Darkness was the idea of random, everyday people getting dragged into a world beyond their understanding and having to just figure out how to deal with it? Yeah, this gets completely obliterated if Dee is the child of Adam and Eve, and by extension, technically the grandchild of God himself. If that's the reason that Dee wants to kill Cain, then suddenly the series transforms into borderline gods fighting over the fate of mortals, and the mortals can't do a damn thing while their fate is decided for them. I feel like we'll have moved thoroughly away from the core premise of World of Darkness's appeal. And putting all of that aside for a moment, I suppose ultimately, what would be gained exactly from D being a child of Adam and Eve? It'd make for a cool set piece I suppose, but I'm not sure how any of the themes or characterization would be helped by it. It kind of feels like a theory that's designed to be, but what if X cool thing happened? And like, yeah, okay, and what if he was a fucking astronaut? What is added by that fact to the core premise of the series exactly? Kitten being a werebeast or a kinfolk or Marcus being a mage would add a new dynamic to the series. It would be new mechanics, new avenues for exploring stories, and new way of introducing those concepts to the wider audience. Even if I'm more in the wait and see camp on those things, I can understand the appeal and the narrative benefits of such a move. I'm at a loss as to what specifically would be added by making D a child of Adam and Eve. It would just be kind of like, okay, cool. How does this change how D interacts with the world? How does this change the story? How does this recontextualize previous events? What new adventures do we get from this that we wouldn't have been able to get if he wasn't their child? I kind of feel like it feels like it's being suggested by people who think that every character needs to have some twist associated with them. Or by people that simply refuse to let HDP be its own thing and are obsessed with making it text to speech too, right down to D being some utterly divine being. Sometimes a spade is just a spade and it's best left as a spade. Also, while we're on the subject, no, D is not the Emperor in the 21st century. I know that's your headcanon, but your headcanon is wrong. Stop it. He's the spiritual successor at best. And even then, I've gone on to say I think that that's unfair to D. References, tongue in cheek jokes. Sure, I love that. But let HDB be its own thing. I am begging you, please. It deserves that respect. Man, I have gone on to piss off basically everyone with these takes, haven't I? No one's going to be happy with me by the end of all of this. I just don't like the idea of all the family being these super unique, rare, super special, supernatural creatures. It's good for influence from each World of Darkness property, sure, but I think it takes away from that ultimate appeal that it is just random regular people who got caught up in all of this. I'll tell you what does work for me though, okay? D being ultimately just some random guy from that time period who has somehow survived this long. Maybe he's from a family of hunters. He's suggested as much, so he's in the know more than most but ultimately just some random bloke. And he isn't immortal, he just doesn't age. And could be killed assuming that someone got a good shot in. That to me works fine, because that way 
Lee is still an accomplished hunter in his own right. He's not fundamentally special. He's just some random dude who ended up with the ability to live far longer than most and everything he's done since then has been of his own skill. He survived on his own merit. He had to learn and fight. And if this were the case, it feels like we'd gain all the advantages of seeing the world in the ancient days without any of the baggage of his proximity to godhood. I'm more than okay with this. That's fine. That can work. That's my two cents on that issue. So now that we have Dee's age talked about, we can move on to one of the bigger mysteries of the series right now. If my tone when covering these two is different, you're going to have to forgive me. I'm on some pretty heavy painkillers for my wisdom teeth as I record it. It's not ideal, but it is what it is. The 99 Pens store in the two-part audio logs Blender Crusade is an interesting one. In it, Dee goes into a 99 Pens store seeking to find a 99 Pens Blender like the glorious madman that he is. He finds a pit in one of the back rooms and falls down into it. When he awakens, he finds himself in another 99p store, where he encounters a blue man at the registry. Despite being immensely knowledgeable about the supernatural, Dee doesn't have even the faintest idea what this creature is. As he is catapulted out of the whatever it is, he awakens to find that a blender he picked up in the store is now in his hands. He even concluded that he didn't actually fall into this hole, because the two workers that were at the store would have had to pull him out of it if he had done, and he fell for seemingly far longer than would have been possible for them to do that. But he still has the blender, which suggests he did physically go there. He refers to this as having been there, but also having not been there. So what is the deal with this 99p store? Or more accurately, what is the pit about and where did D wind up? My guess is that the pit is a portal of some sort and is part of the penumbra, more specifically the Shadowlands. Okay, the penumbra is difficult to explain, so I'm going to just take it from the wiki. The penumbra, also known as the Earth Shadow, is the spirit world directly surrounding the physical world. Many, but not all, terrain features have reflections there. A penumbra is a spirit realm which is linked to a physical world and separates the two with the use of a gauntlet. While a spirit world can appear identical to its material counterpart, it's usually twisted through the lens of concept, metaphor, and point of view. Usually you have to step through the penumbra in order to reach the respective umbral realm. Celestial bodies such as the Moon, Venus or Mars have their own respective penumbra. Basically, their pocket dimensions around the world and different planets have their own respective penumbra. Someone's going to get mad at me for that simplification, but you do better. Anyway, the penumbra and its constituent regions are full of all manner of spirits, one being the Nexus Crawler. This isn't relevant to anything whatsoever, but if I had to witness these creatures, so do you, because you must suffer as I have. Anyway, again, the Shadowlands are the homes of the Wraiths, put simply their ghosts. Roughly 5% of people become Wraiths in times of calm, although more do in times of strife, like war. The Shadowlands are an almost exact replica of the real world. Every single object in the real world has a counterpart in the Shadowlands. Take your house or the street that you are on as you watch this. It too exists in the Shadowlands. But Shadowlands also includes, for example, the World Trade Center, which were knocked down in 2001, or the ruins of ancient Rome or Mesopotamia, meaning that there are also echoes of buildings and objects lost which persist in this pocket dimension. So what is my evidence for this being where D ended up? Hunter the Parenting is a series which is very careful with wording and terminology, and notably, the White Wolf Wiki, which often takes direct quotes from World of Darkness sourcebooks, uses very specific wording. The Shadowlands are a reflection of the Skinlands, the Skinlands being Earth. And if you compare the 99p store that D first goes to in the mundane world, and then the 99p store that he encounters in the pit, it is reflected. This very fits, but it doesn't account for the writing on the front of the store in the underworld, which has completely changed, and I'll be honest, I'm not sure what it is. But I think it has Semitic influences. As an experiment, I put 99p land store into Google Translate, and when I got to Hebrew, I found at least this one character here, which appears to be a near-perfect match, but in order to keep the image mirrored, I then flipped the result and it stopped resembling the writing on the store at all. What it means, if anything, is beyond me, but I thought it might be worth mentioning to see if anyone smarter than I can do anything with that information. Other evidence for the theory is built into the rest of the episode. At the start, D makes it a point to do some people watching. And while this can be him being his normal quirks himself, or him surveying the area for any potential threats, on a writing level it serves as a reminder that there are in fact people in the store, which is then contrasted by the Shadowlands. There are still people in the Shadowlands, just significantly less of them. Which would in theory bring us to the Blue Man, if I had anything in particular that I could say about it. Being completely honest, I'm not sure what exactly they might be. 
The obvious answer is a wraith, as I mentioned. Wraiths are the souls of mortals that died on Earth, usually ones that died unfulfilled or with unfinished business. D seems to recognise the blue man once they drop the facade and begin to laugh at the ignorance of man. This reinforces the idea of it being a wraith. This is someone that D used to know. I think that this might be why D is genuinely horrified by them. It could be a physical corpse possession, like a zombie, this would be called Risen, that could explain why their skin is blue, but I don't honestly have anything to back up that speculation. Beyond my belief that it's a wraith, I have absolutely no idea what else it could be. Like many other theories in Hunter the Parenting, and interestingly enough, just like D said during his and Kitten's conversation in the first audio log, there are things which match and which don't match with this being a wraith. You know, I'm starting to think that the first audio log was just a these are the creatures we're going to be dealing with and how we're going to screw the viewers foreshadowing episode. But back to the point, assuming that the blue man is a wraith, then it does raise the question of why, if this was someone who lived on Earth, they would act so... well, inhuman. The blue man does not act or speak like a person would, it's mostly the same motions, sure. They're working at checkout, they speak to D as a customer, but there's an otherworldly aura to them. They speak in a monotone, they use extremely clinical, impersonal language, and respond to these ramblings not with sheer confusion and bewilderment as they did in the store above, but by barely even reacting, and when they do, they respond in very strange ways. They talk about growth, about the will of fathers turning into the world of sons, and things being as they are in the way that they should be and being there to grow. Frankly, I don't know what that's about. What about the 99p store itself though? Well, it's pretty likely that the store is just that, a 99p store. The fact that it was built on an abandoned chalk mine is interesting. If true, it could suggest that this particular place has a naturally occurring connection to the penumbra which the store and the mine were constructed to prevent the general public from falling into. The store is also managed by someone who seems to be a ghoul or at the very least is loyal to the Camarilla regent in the area. What would vampires want with this place? Well, there is some lore that some clans can actually connect, interact, and even store items within the Shadowlands, using it as a sort of container of sorts. So maybe that's what we're seeing? The Camarilla using this territory as a storage unit or as a place to hide during the day? There is a vampiric connection there. But this is my guess, because this is very funny to me, but there's also a fair bit of evidence to suggest this. This 99p store is the Camarilla Chantry. A meeting place, a hideout, and a base of operations for the region. What is my evidence for this? In Big D's guide to avoiding arrest, Chapman mentions that his regent and presumably the Chantry by extension are in Great Yarmouth. D is headed to Great Yarmouth at the start of the audio log. The store owner seems to recognise Kevin's name, and most interestingly, when he talks about it in the probing of Kevin, Kevin mentions that he had to scrounge for arcane lore from the shelves of the 99 pence stores. That's a lot of things coinciding. So my guess is that this store is being used as a Chantry. It is admittedly a lot of circumstantial evidence, but I think it makes sense. With that, at a close, let's go to what I think for many is the main reason that we're here. Let's talk about the murder mystery whodunit of Chapter 4. Here we go, the big one. In Chapter 4, we learn that a ghoul has infiltrated the Yarmouth Chapter House of the Arcanum. Kevin revealed this information to Dee and Dee took the family to go and uncover the imposter. From there, it's become a mystery as people started running off doing their own thing, their own investigations and interrogation tactics and conflicts with one another. A whole lot of stuff happened, all at once, from a spit having a mental breakdown and Fatigue trying to help him through it, to Occam being attacked, to Blacklaw trying to torture information out of people, there were a lot of moving threads all happening at once. By the end of the episode, Fatigue has been... brutally murdered. Spit is cowering on the floor, Giles is locked in a room, and nearly half the cast is unaccounted for. So the question is this, who did this? Who is responsible for what has happened here? Who is the ghoul? There are a lot of moving parts to all of this and a lot of information to consider. Occam's razor is a principle that states that the most obvious solution is likely the correct one. And considering that we have a character introduced in this chapter who is called Occam, with a sharp beard, presumably from using a razor, it would dictate that we at least consider the most obvious answers. So let's break it down. Here are our suspects. What do we know here? How can we narrow them down? In the probing of Kevin, we know that Kevin has been on the run from the Camarilla for, as he puts it, years. And he knows about the existence of the ghoul in the Arcanum chapter house. This must mean, by definition, that our suspects must be people who have been within the Arcanum chapter house for years. We also know in the audio log, Marcus goes clubbing, that Grimmel, despite being a member of the Arcanum, 
has no idea who Brock, Spit and Giles are, despite them working as the security for the chapter house. And we know that this audio lock happens between chapters 3 and 4 because the events of 3 are mentioned and there's no non-linear storytelling happening here because if there was then Grimmel would know who the three of them were by the end of the murder mystery's entire escapade. This must mean that they are very recent hires. Spit even confirms this. Therefore, this means that the ghoul cannot be one of those three. It simply doesn't add up. Now, one of the implications of the episode is that there isn't just one supernatural creature here, but at the very least, two. We know that there is a ghoul because of what Kevin said, but the evidence that there is a secondary creature comes from Fatigue's murder. But simply, he was utterly torn to shreds and there appear to be claw marks all over his torso. There's also the fact that, put simply, the ghoul was after information about the hunters. It seemed to have already acquired that information. Killing Fatigue doesn't make any amount of sense at this point, especially not now. Occam was attacked, but if we assume that the ghoul did that, why kill Fatigue but not Occam? Killing Occam could have ensured that their identity was kept secret at least for a longer period of time, as Occam had a ritual that would uncover the traitor. Killing Fatigue, who doesn't seem capable of aiding in figuring out who the ghoul is, but sparing Occam, who can, is backwards. To me, this suggests that the ghoul doesn't want to hurt any of the Arcana members, or at the very least not kill any of them. They're not even willing to kill the single biggest threat to their identity being uncovered. But something else is willing to kill Fatigue. All of this suggests a secondary supernatural being. And if that's the case, what's the most likely candidate? Now, the sheer brutality of the attack suggests a werewolf to me. But the brutality is, regrettably, all we really have to go off of. Some point to the claw marks on this dresser, but those were present before Fatigue's death. So this could suggest that if there is a werewolf in here, that they've undergone transformations before now, but that's the only evidence that we've got. Some people theorize that Spit underwent his first transformation into a werewolf and accidentally killed Fatigue while doing so. This is plausible and would certainly be the most obvious answer, but I don't know how likely it is. Namely due to one thing, is clothing. When a werewolf undergoes their first change, they don't know how to keep their clothes intact. They have to undergo rituals and training to do that. If this is Spit's first transformation, he is an extremely naturally gifted werewolf. It's also his age. We know that he went to school with Marcus, and we know that Marcus is at least 30. Most werewolves undergo their first change when they're in their teenage years. I don't think it's Spit personally. I think he's suffering from the delirium, the supernatural panic humans undergo when dealing with werewolves that Dee mentioned in his and Kitten's talk. This doesn't explain this freakout from before Fatigue's death, but it explains the freakout after. There's all manner of stuff. People stealing stuff from other people's pockets, which casts suspicion on everyone. Elise steals Giles' cigarettes, keys and wallet, which suggests her being a traitor, only to then be smoking them, not really hiding this fact, and seemingly giving the smokes to the staff, which may suggest she just wants to screw with Giles and that she might actually get on with the staff. Giles did harass her at the pub after all. Look, if I go down this route looking at every single aspect of incriminating evidence for everyone, we'd be here all day. We wouldn't get to the actual conclusions for a while, so I'm going to go to who I think are the ones responsible and then present the evidence that I think condemns them. So who do I think is the ghoul? I think it's Grimmel. I really, really hope that I'm wrong on that. I adore Grimmel. I really, really do. But I can't lie, I think that she's the one who has the most evidence that makes the most sense and the strongest case against her. Throughout her appearance in the clubbing audio log, a lot of subtle importance is placed on her. She's easily the one that speaks the most, has the most characterization given, and impacts the plot the most next to Marcus. Her character is called to attention the most, while Elise and Harry are left more or less completely alone. We know next to nothing about Harry or Elise, but we know plenty about Grimmel. And you wouldn't do this for a character that you didn't have plans for fairly soon. And again, in Chapter 4, out of all of Marcus's group of friends, she's the one with the most emphasis put onto her. That alone isn't enough to go off of, but I have more. Let's go through some of the information that we have, shall we? 1. We know that she's been in the Arcanum for a while. How long precisely, we don't know. But we do know that she and Kitten knew one another before Dee and his family came back to England. We also know that Kitten has been in the know about the supernatural since he was in university. In England, the youngest that most people go to university is when they're 18. On average, most courses take three or four years, 
We know that Kitten knew about vampires because he had an encounter with one at university. We do know that she was arguably the first person he knew was also in the know about the supernatural. Assuming that they're both roughly the same age, give or take a year or two, according to my research, Kitten is in his mid-30s. We also know that Kevin is 27 and mentioned it secret that he knew the region had years ago. We're making a lot of assumptions here, but if they're right, then that places Grimmel in the time frame that Kevin is describing. Two, in the pubbing audio log, it is mentioned that Grimmel often sneaks into the vents to listen in on the more senior members of the chapter house talking about subjects that lower ranking members aren't supposed to, which is a very suspect thing to do at the best of times. Three, after her fight with Kitten, we get a map which shows us where everyone is and the layout of the chapter house. If we look at Grimmel's Arcanum license, we see that she has student access clearance. Going back to the map, she's in the security room, looking at the key, and then back at the room, that room doesn't have student access. She shouldn't be there. So how the hell did she get in there in the first place? On top of that, when Kitten speaks to the staff, Matilda mentions that the security room is the most ventilated room in the building. Ergo, vents. The thing that Grimmel goes through to listen to information that she shouldn't have access to. 5. When they're all walking through the archive, we see this frozen caveman here. And if we look here, that looks like a vent to me. Grimmel has displayed a tendency to go through the vents, and when everyone splits off, we know that she is in the single most ventilated room in the building, and we can see what looks like a vent, which is being used to keep the frozen caveman cold. Remember, her fight with Kitten and her splitting off from the group happened straight after they all left Occam to his rituals. She's in the right place, she's there at the right time, and she's unaccounted for until Occam is discovered, and she's attached enough to the chapter house and the people in it that I don't think she'd want to kill any of them everything fits. There's also a slightly more subtle clue that's hinted at in the clubbing audio log, where she's implied to be a lot tougher than she looks, able to fight against Brock and his goons, and she's also able to help carry Marcus after he's injured, despite the massive size difference between the two of them. And we know that ghouls tend to be a lot stronger than regular humans. Chapman brags about that much. I think that this is fairly airtight, but that's not even my main reasoning for her being the ghoul. I think it's her because it makes the most narrative sense and is more in line with the demon prophecy. Kitten takes comfort when fighting the supernaturals by dehumanizing them and referring to vampires as not being the person that they were before, but something else wearing the skin of who they used to be. Now he can say that, but I don't think he's emotionally prepared to write Grimmel off that way. The two of them fight and it's obvious that Kitten has a lot of anger towards her, but I don't think he is at the I actively wish her dead level of anger. I think that dealing with a supernatural Grimmel would seriously impact and affect him. And Marcus and Grimmel get along, so he's obviously not going to be gung-ho about doing what needs to be done to her. Indeed, just so happens to have a vampire back home which could provide blood for a ghoul if needed. Like with Chapman. And the reveal that Dee is keeping a vampire alive and has an alliance with it, that would probably infuriate Dor. Dor hates vampires. To him, they're not people. To see Dee treating one like a friend or a person and going to bat for them, it would cause a major rift between the whole family. To me, the evidence is there, and that there are plenty of good narrative reasons for it to be Grimmel. Why she's ended up like this, if it was willing or not, that I don't know. She doesn't seem too willing. But then why didn't she come forward when Occam asked the ghoul to? Gee, I don't know, maybe it had something to do with the fact that he threatened to fucking burn them to death. Again, I really hope I'm wrong. Or at the absolute least, I hope that Grimmel doesn't die. So that's the ghoul. What about the werewolf idea? If it's not Spit when he's right there covered in blood and the only other person in the room with fat of you when he died, who the hell else could it be? My guess? This lady here, Matilda Wilde. So my evidence for her being a werewolf is a hell of a lot less solid than my evidence for Grimmel. It's mostly down to her being a complete and utter prick. Like she is utterly asocial and rude and contemptuous of basically everyone and everything around her. Most werewolves hold a lot of human society in sheer contempt. The conflict for werewolves is that they serve Gaia, which is the spirit of the earth, basically. There are a multitude of corrupting forces and much of humanity's civilizational excesses contribute to that corruption. A spirit known as the worm with an Y instead of an O. I'm, I'm oversimplifying again, but basically imagine werewolves as deity ordained eco-terrorists and you'll understand them pretty clearly. They're also very proud creatures. Matilda seems to be completely unfazed by the existence of the supernatural, which is contrasted next to her co-worker Amanda, who is mostly baffled and then uneasy and concerned as she starts to realise that the rest of them are not screwing around. 
Matilda remains completely unfazed, even after seeing Occam having been assaulted. She lacks many basic social graces. She spits on the floor when referred to as the help, which, I mean, I get it, it's disrespectful, but I feel like spitting on the floor is a bit of an excess. She basically takes every opportunity she can to just be kind of a twat to people around her. The sheer level of contempt that she has may be indicative of a general dislike of civilization and of humans, whom many werewolves aren't especially fond of. Werewolves can also manifest into three main forms. Humanoid form, when they're pretty much indistinguishable from a regular human. A wolf form, where they're indistinguishable from a wolf. And a war form, where they look like the stereotypical werewolf. Depending on which one of these they're more inclined to, it can impact their attitudes in the other. For example, a werewolf who is more inclined towards their human form will be a lot better at interacting with human civilization, but not especially good at hunting, and a wolf form might be better at working with nature, but not so good at working with civilizational situations. Another bit of evidence for this is Matilda's Arcanum license. Look at this handwriting. Don't judge people by their handwriting and all that, but this is barely even legible. It looks like she's never had to write before in her entire life. Also, wild. As in, she's from the wild. Ergo, her last name is wild. Werewolves don't tend to have last names, so I suspect that this was the best she could come up with. There is also one other piece of information which, if I'm right, may explain her hostility. Werewolves are very susceptible to falling into primordial otherworldly anger during a full moon. They call it the rage. They can constantly feel it gnawing at them, and it can occasionally turn into a frenzy. In Werewolves, this is unchecked, instinctual savagery. They can even attack their teammates if they're not careful. And the literal first thing in Chapter 4, we see Dee throwing a door open, silhouetted by a full moon. My theory is that Matilda is a werewolf. Probably one used to living more in the wild as part of a cairn, a werewolf pack. Likely one that spends far more time in wolf or werewolf form and thus lacks a lot of experience or tolerance for civilization. What she's after in the Yarmouth Chapter House, I've nary a clue. That I can't even begin to speculate on. It could be that the werewolves simply don't want anyone looking into them. It depends on the pack. Werewolf packs are as diverse as vampire clan, so it's difficult to make any real generalizations. But, well, there we go. Those are my theories. Grimble is the ghoul and Matilda is a werewolf. But what about Spit? He kept rambling on about having issues focusing and his head screaming at him. What's his deal if he's not involved in any of this? I'm not sure. He could just have mental issues. That is fully possible. But there is a possibility that he's been imbued. Basically, some hunters in Hunter the Reckoning are contacted by messengers. Who and what they are, no one has a clue. But they give their chosen person information, awareness, and in some case, abilities. Which they are then able to use and are meant to hunt monsters. It's possible that that's what he's experiencing and he's simply overwhelmed. The wiki seems to talk about these imbued like they're hearing phrases and words trying to get them to act or do something. I wonder if this might be why Spitz utterly freaks out when he reached Matilda. Matilda. The messenger might be trying to warn him about her, and he's utterly freaked out by it, which is why he reacts in such a major way. The idea that he's been imbued would fit, but it's also the one with the least actual proof to it, so I thought I'd just mention it in passing. And with that, we've run out of furies to go over for now. God, I'm tired. <laughs> Do you agree or disagree? A lot of these are patchworked, merely speculative, or my own thoughts on the matters. What I'm hoping for more than anything is that the HTP community can put their collective heads together and see if we can't figure this one out. The HTP community is a lot of fun and very chill, and between everyone out there, there's a lot of information that we have, so maybe we can put all of that together. Maybe some of you noticed something that I missed. This has been an unusual style of video for me, and time will tell if I prove that I have psychic powers or if I'm an idiot. But in any case, I'm gonna go pass out. I hope you enjoyed this, and I'll be seeing you in hopefully something different next time. See ya.